Chapter 12 My dear Wormwood, Obviously you are making excellent progress. My only fear is, less than attempting to hurry the patient, you awaken in him to a sense of his real position. For you and I, who see that position as it really is, must never forget how totally different it ought to appear to him. We know that we have introduced a change of direction in his course, which is already carrying him out of his orbit around the enemy. But he must be made to imagine that all the choices which have affected this change of course are trivial and revocable. He must not be allowed to suspect that he is now, however slowly, heading right away from the sun on a line which will carry him into the cold and dark of utmost space. For this reason, I am almost glad to hear that he is still a churchgoer and a communicant. I know there are dangers in this, but anything is better than that he should realize the break it has made with the first months of his Christian life. As long as he retains externally the habits of a Christian, he can still be made to think of himself as one who has adopted a few new friends and amusements, but whose spiritual state is much the same as it was six weeks ago. And while he thinks that, we do not have to contend with the explicit repentance of a definite, fully recognized sin, but only with this vague, uneasy feeling that he hasn't been doing very well lately. This dim uneasiness needs careful handling. If it gets too strong, it may wake him up and spoil the whole game. On the other hand, if you suppress it entirely, which, by the way, the enemy will probably not allow you to do, we lose an element in the situation which can be turned to good account. If such a feeling is allowed to live, but not allowed to become irresistible and then flower into real repentance, it has one invaluable tendency. It increases the patient's reluctance to think about the enemy. All humans, at nearly all times, have some such reluctance, but when thinking of him involves facing and intensifying the whole vague cloud of half-conscious guilt, this reluctance is increased tenfold. They hate every idea that suggests him, just as men in financial embarrassment hate the very sight of a checkbook. In this state, your patient will not omit but he will increasingly dislike his religious duties. He will think about them as little as he feels he can decently beforehand and forget them as soon as possible when they are over. A few weeks ago, you had to tempt him to unreality and inattention to his prayers, but now you will find him opening his arms to you and almost begging you to distract his purpose and benumb his heart. He will want his prayers to be unreal, for he will dread nothing so much as effective contact with the enemy. His aim will be to let sleeping worms lie. As this condition becomes more fully established, you will be gradually freed from the tiresome business of providing pleasures as temptations. As the uneasiness and his reluctance to face it cut him off more and more from all real happiness, and as habit renders the pleasures of vanity and excitement and flippancy at once less pleasant and harder to forego, for that is what habit fortunately does to a pleasure, you will find that anything or nothing is sufficient to attract his wandering attention. You no longer need a good book which he really likes, to keep him from his prayers or his work or his sleep. A column of advertisements in yesterday's paper will do. You can make him waste his time, not only in conversation he enjoys with people whom he likes, but in conversations with those 
he cares nothing about on subjects that bore him. You can make him do nothing at all for long periods of time. You can keep him up late at night, not roistering, but staring at a dead fire in a cold room. All the healthy and outgoing activities which we want him to avoid can be inhibited and nothing given in return, so that at last he may say, as one of my own patients said on his arrival down here, I now see that I spent most of my life in doing neither what I ought nor what I liked. <laughs> the Christians describe the enemy as one without whom nothing is strong, and nothing is very strong. Strong enough to steal away a man's best years, not in sweet sins, but in a dreary flickering of the mind over it knows not what and knows not why. In the gratification of curiosities so feeble that the man is only half aware of them. In drumming of fingers and kicking of heels in whistling tunes that he does not like, or in the long, dim labyrinth of reveries that have not even lust or ambition to give them a relish, but which, once chance association has started them, the creature is too weak and fuddled to shake off. You will say that these are all small sins, and doubtless like all you young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report really spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape.